things I didn't plan on saying, but I'm going to take a minute anyway. One of the things over the years of John's service that we became aware of is the family environment that he has compared to other services. And I think this gathering today is a classic example of exactly what a family in the Navy is. And I've always, since I became educated, appreciated that. And I thank all you Navy guys and gals for what you've done and how you've helped to shape him into a respectable officer. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is he alluded to that talked a little bit about my experience in the field artillery. And Part of that, besides shooting a lot of ammunition, uh, involved hooking up howitzers and rounds of ammunition to CH-53s and 47s and everything else. And you can't hook up a howitzer standing 300 feet away. <laughs> Somebody's got to be under there making the connection with the chopper. So, you know, you've got to be 150 feet away from the <laughs> I guess that's the only difference I have. <laughs> anyway, I'm very privileged, I consider myself privileged and honored to be here. We are just a little past a significant date in June when John, our fifth child, was born at Midway Hospital in St. Paul. A summer day, not that I remember, but I do know I had just completed two years on the job with St. Paul Police and was promoted to Staff Sergeant E6 in the United States Army Reserve in Fort Snow. We lived in our house on Marshall Avenue. One of the aspects of working in the public sector, as John and I have done, is that everything is a matter of public record. So today, I decided to talk about things that are not necessarily a matter of public record. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was never convicted. <laughs> John was quickly assimilated to our family. A constant for all of us. Donna and I too, even when we were children, was being members of St. Mark's Parish in St. Paul. It was a great church and school, but difficult on him and his siblings because they had to walk all the way to school and back each day. <laughs> a whole block and a half. <laughs> and there were no snow days back then either. Of course, there were family recreational experiences such as bringing friends in on our blue school bus to the roller rink, <laughs> experiencing periodic venting sessions, which included rolling the car windows down, and everyone screaming as loud as they could, causing cars in the area to pull over for the emergency vehicle. <laughs> <they found> the <laughs> or in other situations, we would actually line everybody up alongside the road and see who could yell the loudest. <laughs> the veins on John's neck really stand out as he worked so hard to try to be the loudest. Basketball at home was always big. And there were the times they took pictures trying to look like slam dunking pros. And it, but the difference was they were standing on a 55-gallon drum. <laughs> of course, the picture doesn't show that. That ended when the hoop and backboard fell off the garage roof without hitting any of the players, thankfully. Grade school whizzed by quite fast, including a year in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and a couple of years in Germany. Then we were back in our home on Wilder in the St. Mark's community. <laughs> Schoolwork was complemented by Cub Scouts and playing football for my old coach, Joe Myers. I might add that he was Donna's coach, too. We further challenged all the kids with the intake of foster children and found the skills and knowledge of John and his siblings made life easier for them as they adjusted into our family. 
John did well at St. Mark's and seemed to flow into Creighton and the start of his high school education with no problem. John had a paper out to help pay for tuition and among his customers was Mrs. Trainer, who was the grandmother of the twins, Joe Mauer. But once again, he missed out on an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> too soon, too soon. The little old ladies on this route would call and have him bring bread or milk from the store when he brought their morning paper and thought he was such a good boy. And every time I heard that, I said, who are they talking about? <laughs> John did not have to work to achieve academically, but we did experience some contrary behaviors now and then. Most prominently was probably when Donna had to go to a girl's house during the wee hours of the morning. Really? You're going to share that now? <laughs> subsequent trip to the impound lot, particularly where John had to pound out all the dents in the front fender so that he could drive his car home. <laughs> Traffic court was the consequence, and later John decided to switch to a motorcycle. This lasted, I don't know how many days, until he dumped bike while exiting from the freeway and got hauled away in an ambulance. Are there highlights in this? <laughs> Most likely this served to be an enlightening common sense experience that served well to keep him on the straight and narrow into college. Maybe you don't agree with but that's my impression by the name you made him a pilot. John had to cover most of the cost for his freshman year at the University of Minnesota because he did not qualify for grants or scholarships. He wore himself out working that hot summer at Horner Waldorf Paper Company and had to quit a whole week before school started just so he could get his strength back up to his old challenge. <laughs> He studied hard that year, that first year, and as a result, qualified for a Navy three-year scholarship. Congratulations. Didn't know what he was getting into, neither did I. As a part of the Navy curriculum, traditional events were emphasized, and the most memorable would have to have been the dining in at the Fort Snelling Officers Club, where we both became aware of the effects of alcohol. <laughs>